right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's conservation event. My name is Joe Gorowski from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and I'll be your host for today. It is time for animals to take fate into their own paws. The Endangered is the first book in a thrilling new adventure series by world-renowned environmentalist and Emmy-nominated host of Exploration Awesome Planet, Philippe Cousteau, and award-winning Turbo Racers author, Austin Aslan. We're teaming up with Earth Echo International and World Wildlife Fund to host a series of virtual events this month, diving deeper into the understanding of real world conservation threats to species featured in the first book of the Endangered series. So the polar bear, orangutan, narwhal, pangolin, and the black footed uh, ferret. So today our focus is going to be on the polar bears and we have a great event in store for you today. Before we dive into the polar bear action, I am going to introduce Philippe Cousteau who is joining us live today. He's the grandson of Jacques Cousteau, a famous uh, ocean explorer. He's a television host, an author, a speaker, and he's also the founder of Earth Echo International, an amazing youth conservation organization. Philippe, it is so great to have you joining us live today. Uh, Joe, it's always a thrill and so excited, particularly to be able to talk about one of my favorite creatures, uh, polar bear, and really the, the the probably the star of this first book as well, New Killick, the character in the book, um, the, the polar bear. So um, yeah, we, and we are so fortunate to be able to talk with Alyssa today about uh, her work, her extraordinary work with these animals in the real world and take questions and it's going to be a blast. So I'm thrilled. Absolutely. Well, Philippe, I'm going to let you take over for a little bit. We'd love to know a little bit about, you know, where the idea for this this series came about and why it's so important at this time. Absolutely. You know, Joe, it, it was um, The Endangered is, you know, as you said, it's a it's a new book uh, came out uh, about a month ago uh, um, with Harper Collins and my co-author Austin Aslan. And um, it was a book that that's really inspired by the fact that um, you know, there's some scary news out there. If uh, uh, in particular, you know, a few years ago when we were talking about working together with Harper on, on a book series for for um, for young readers, uh, I, you know, in the back of my mind, all the information about biodiversity collapse, environmental collapse was really kind of running over and over. And uh, and so in, in particular reminded just what about um, a couple months ago, or maybe a little bit more than that now, World Wildlife Fund came out with a very terrifying report that in the last 40 years, so in my lifetime, I turned 40 this year, we have lost half of the biodiversity on this planet. Uh, that's terrifying. And so we wanted to find a way to tap into the passion that young people have about nature and animals, uh, particularly that age. This is a middle grade reader book. It's you know targeted to about eight to 13 years old. Um, and, and But also tell a story about empowerment and hope and returning balance to the world. And so we decided on um, telling a story of, of some animals, in particular, the ones that you you uh, you listed, Joe, really embody a lot of the, the different challenges that endangered species are facing in the world today, be it the wildlife trade, the pet trade, deforestation and habitat loss, climate change in the Arctic, of course, which is what's affecting polar bears so dramatically. Um, and uh, do it and, you know, tell the story in a way that is a, a rousing and fun and exciting adventure, first and foremost but then also really gets to the core of some of the challenges. So to kick things off, I wanted to, actually, I was gonna read the first chapter here to you all of The Endangered, which um, starts with Nukilic and her story, and then um, talk a little bit uh, with Alyssa about the reality and her really exciting work, and uh, then we can go to questions. But I wanna start here to provide a little context for you to understand uh, uh, where, where it all comes from. So chapter one, the shore was too far away. The polar bear leaned forward and gazed out across the great ocean. The mass of snow-patched land that was her home was half a day's march from here, or it would be if the ice bridge hadn't melted. She tensed, swimming that distance would take great strength, perhaps more than she had. A voice snapped her from her thoughts. Stay back from the edge, New Killick. The ice could break under your weight. You're not a cub anymore. I know, mother. Oh, I'm mother now. What happened to mama? New Killick huffled her annoyance. She was starting to understand why bears her age usually struck off on their own. I'm not a cub anymore, remember? Nukilik was ready, she thought, to leave mother's side. According to the ways, it was time. But Nukilik could not set out to explore the great realm alone right now. She and her mother were trapped on a drifting island of ice, starving and weak and growing weaker. Hunger gnawed at her belly. The bears had waited days for the ice sheet to drift toward land or for a bridge of ice to refreeze, but it was too warm. 
based on where the, where the day star rose and set and the length of the nights with their green ribbon displays, she and mother should have been safe venturing so far out over the ice to find food. They had gone out, but they never found food. And now they were cut off from home and Nukilik's tongue was salty and dry. So um, it goes on from there, of course. Uh, um, and these characters uh, travel all over the world. Nukilik meets this motley crew of, of other hyper-intelligent animals at a secret research facility in the Galapagos where they get this hyper-intelligence and then they go on adventures around the world. But um, part of the, the story and what was really important to us in this story was, was, was trying to give, get across the real challenges that animals are facing in the context of a fun adventure. And we actually worked very closely with World Wildlife Fund and, and scientists in, in terms of framing the kinds of challenges that animals are facing accurately. So the whole backstory of McKillick and, and where this book opens up is one of the big, really illustrates one of the big challenges that the polar bears are facing. So anyway, with that, I'd love to, to keep, uh, keep going forward, Joe, and um, jump into the next section. All right, absolutely. Well, Fluke, thanks for that great uh, introduction. I'm gonna tuck you backstage just ever so briefly uh, as we prepare for the next phase. So I think it's, it's really fitting that we're starting off with polar bears today, uh, being that they are featured so heavily uh, in the book, The Endangered. And I'm gonna bring in um, our expert, Elisa, joining us today. Uh, Elisa is McCall is the Director of Conservation Outreach and a staff scientist at Polar Bears International. She gained hands-on experience with polar bears from multiple fall and spring field seasons in Tuk 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 and Churchill and has been heavily involved in collaring and tracking uh, Hudson Bay polar bears. She's passionate about science education and a polar bear and polar bear conservation and dedicated to ensuring that uh, you know future generations can see uh, polar bears on a healthy uh, uh, planet. And so uh, Elisa is joining us live from Whitehorse uh, in Canada in the Yukon. Uh, Elisa, it's so great to have you joining us live today. Yeah, thanks for the invite, Joe. So happy to be here. All right, excellent. Well, I've had the pleasure of hosting you several times in the past. Um, you know, the work that you do and the work that Polar Bear International does is incredible. So I'm excited to let you take over for a little bit and take us into your world. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining today and being interested in polar bears. And thank you, Philippe, for that wonderful first chapter reading. I can't wait to read your book. That was so illustrative of what polar bears are going through. So I'm going to share my screen with you for a moment here. Um, I would like to show you, I just have a little presentation. Let me make sure I'm okay. Here we go. Because I want to show you some cool pictures of polar bears. Is this working? Here we go. I'm going to talk to you a bit about what makes polar bears so cool and what we're doing to ensure that they stay in the Arctic always. So I work for Polar Bears International, as Joe said, and I've been studying polar bears for about 10 years now. This is my 10th year. So that first picture on the left is 10 years ago, and the one on the right is just a couple years ago. I used to do a little bit more field work actually on the sea ice, but you know, even full-time polar bear biologists really don't do a lot of field work with polar bears. Uh, the time that they're accessible is pretty short. So even the top polar bear biologists only really do a few weeks of field work a year where polar bear conservation is really accomplished is in the office and the classroom and at home. And that's through storytelling and inspiring people to care about the polar bear and letting them know what's going on with the polar bear. We really believe that if people understand an animal better, they're more likely to love it. And if they love something, they're more likely to want to protect it. So that's why we love talking about polar bears and what they're going through. They are an incredible species, very, very worthy of our attention. Okay, so they are, of course, big and beautiful and built for the cold. I think everyone probably knows that this is very much an Arctic animal. They are the largest bear species on Earth out of the eight bear species. Uh, they are the most carnivorous. So these bears really rely on um, eating other animals. They can't make a living on land like other bears can. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but you can see these animals are so built to live on the ice and snow from their fur, which is two layers. They have really thick, uh, dense under fur that's kind of like wearing a woolly sweater. And then their outer fur is kind of longer and wicks moisture away. And it's kind of like wearing a raincoat. So they've got these two double layers. They also uh, have fur that is hollow and clear. So polar bears are not actually white but they just look white to our eyes the way that the light reflects off their fur. So polar bear hair is actually clear and the hollowness helps trap warm air against their body. So they can be in temperatures that are easily minus 40, minus 50 degrees Celsius, and they're still doing pretty darn well out there. 
in the Arctic. Uh, they also have a thick layer of body fat and a long nose. Their nose has so much surface area inside. If you think about if you're outside in the winter and you take in a big breath of cool air, it kind of hurts. <laughs> it can kind of hurt your lungs. Well, if you're a polar bear, your nose is so long and has so much surface area that when you breathe in through your nose, by the time that cold air reaches your lungs, it's been nicely warmed up for you. Uh, so it's a little bit easier for them to breathe that cold, cold Arctic air. They also have incredibly sharp claws, incredibly sharp. So these claws, of course, help them catch their prey and give them traction on their habitat, which is Arctic sea ice. So polar bears rely on sea ice. In fact, they are considered a marine mammal. They're not even considered a terrestrial or land animal. They are so closely tied to the ocean uh, that they're a marine animal, which I think is pretty neat, especially for a bear. They cannot live long term on land. These bears very much need to live on this Arctic sea ice, and that is what they're meant to do. So why is that? because of what they eat. So the reason that polar bears get so big is because of their diet, which consists mainly of blubber. So I've heard polar bears referred to as white furry blubber machines or blubber vacuums, and that is what they wanna eat all day, every day. And most of that blubber comes from seals. So on the right here is what we call a bearded seal. Uh, polar bears also eat ringed seals and they will absolutely also try to either catch small whales or feast on dead whales that wash up on shore. And they are bears, so they'll eat whatever they can find, but their number one source of food is seal blubber. And that's why they need to roam the Arctic Ocean and the sea ice, because they wait at breathing holes. You can see that bear on the left there is waiting at a bearded sea, bearded seal breathing hole. Seals, of course, need to breathe air, so they swim underwater, and eventually they need to come up for air. And polar bears know this, and they are very patient hunters. So this is one of the main ways that polar bears hunt. They wait quietly by a seal hole, and when the seal pops up for air, the bear dives in and grabs that seal out with the sharp claws I mentioned and with its sharp teeth. And it will eat the seal blubber. Seal blubber has so many calories, which means so much energy. It is one of the most calorie dense foods on earth. And that is why polar bears get so, so, so big. And they're able to survive on this crazy cold Arctic sea ice because they have all this food and all this energy in the form of seal blubber. So it's so critical that they have access to these seals. And that's also why we find polar bears where we do. So we find them across the Arctic uh, where we find seals in the sea ice. So these are the 19 different subpopulations of polar bears. So if we look all across the world, we can divide the polar bears up into 19 different groups run by different countries, including Canada, the US, Russia, Greenland, and Norway. And Canada has 13 of the world's polar bear populations. So two thirds of the world's polar bears live in Canada, which is pretty neat. And what we're seeing in these different areas, of course, if you look all across the Arctic, it's such a big place. Polar bears are facing different threats at different times. So in some areas we have more pollutants and in some areas we have more shipping and more people and the ice is doing different things in different areas. So some populations of polar bears are still stable and healthy. Their sea ice hasn't yet changed much in the high, high Arctic areas. But what we are seeing is that in some areas, including the Hudson Bay region of Canada, which is kind of on the right hand side of your screen there, sea ice is changing already. And so we are seeing changes in polar bears. Now it's not only polar bears that depend on sea ice though. So as the sea ice changes, it's not only polar bears that are feeling impacts. Sea ice is to the ocean what soil is to a forest. Sea ice actually grows the base of the Arctic food chain, which is pretty darn cool, I think. The way that sea ice freezes, uh, because it's salty and uh, when the ice freezes, it forms all these fissures. Algae actually grows up inside the sea ice, which feeds all these little creatures up to the fish, up to the seal, up to the polar bear. So without sea ice, we don't have an Arctic ecosystem. And of course, people are a part of this ecosystem as well. Many communities live across the North and also rely on a healthy ecosystem. What we're seeing is that we're losing sea ice. So this, just imagine this is um, illustrating the amount of sea ice we have over the last 40 years, and we're seeing a slow trend down, well, fast trend down, really. Every year is a little different. You can see there's ups and downs and ups and downs, but the overall trend is down. And so this is why we're concerned about polar bears, because they're losing their home, their habitat. And again, what that mainly means is that polar bears aren't 
getting enough food. And that would happen to any animal that's starting to lose its home. If you lose access to your food, uh, you're not as big, you're not as healthy, and females have a harder time having babies. And so that impacts the health of the population and the size of the population. So we are concerned about sea ice. And if nothing were to change, then what we could do or what we could see is that we'd start with, if this represents the amount of polar bears in the world right now, by the end of the century, we could lose about two thirds of the world's polar bears. So it's a big change, but the cool thing is that we know what we need to do for polar bears. Right now, they are considered uh, vulnerable and threatened by climate change across the world. And it's not only the Arctic that depends on Arctic sea ice. Uh, no matter where you're coming from right now in your classroom, Arctic sea ice, believe it or not, actually also plays a role in your climate where you are. Because Arctic sea ice is so big and so white, it reflects sunlight away. This prevents the sunlight from being absorbed into the ocean and it helps cool the whole planet. So we sometimes call Arctic sea ice the Earth's air conditioner. So if you think about the Arctic helping cool the entire world, you can see it's pretty important, not just for polar bears, not just for the Arctic uh, ecosystem, but for all of us. So let's help keep polar bears around. The cool, cool thing about polar bears is that we call them an umbrella species. And an umbrella species is one that, when you do something that helps that species, all the other animals under it in the food web are helped as well, including people in this case. So whatever we can do to help protect polar bears is going to help protect people. So what I do and what Polar Bears International does is a bunch of different things. We do research. So we do our own research on polar bears and we support other people's research on polar bears. Again, the more we learn about this animal, the better we can protect them. So we research things uh, like where the polar bears are moving and when and how it's impacted by sea ice. We're also looking at uh, polar bear human conflict and trying to prevent um, polar bears and people from being in contact too often as polar bears spend longer on land in certain areas. We also do a lot of media. Uh, so there's photos and videos that we take and everyone has access to them. So if you're ever looking for a polar bear photo or video, please come to our website or let us know. We'd be happy to help give you what we have. Uh, we also do a lot of interviews like this and we just wanna make polar bears accessible to people no matter where you are. And part of that is also education. So we love telling people about polar bears and talking to students and talking to adults about them. And again, spreading that love because they are so, so, so neat. So this is one way we do this. And this is such a great week to be talking to everybody because this is actually Polar Bear Week. So the first week of November is always Polar Bear Week for us. And this is usually what I would be on right now. So we call this Polar Bear Monster Truck. This is Tundra Buggy One. And this buggy lives in Churchill, Manitoba. And right now, today, every day, uh, this week and this month and next month, maybe, um, Buggy One is out roaming around looking for polar bears. So there's a camera mounted on this buggy and it can actually stream to the internet, even in some of the worst weather possible. And it rolls around on trails that are set and it looks for polar bears. And it's been streaming polar bears for a few weeks now and it's out today. So I'm gonna check in with them when we're done here and see how they're doing. Uh, but this is a way that we can then connect with classrooms. So usually this is what we're doing at this time of year. Of course, this year there are some travel restrictions, but we sit on buggy one surrounded by polar bears and we stream to classrooms and answer questions and we collect amazing footage. So I wanna show you, this is one of my favorite clips from the polar bear cam from a year ago. So this is a polar bear digging up a meadow vole and hunting. So it's kind of funny because I've been talking this whole time about how polar bears need sea ice to live and that's very, very true. But in Churchill, Manitoba for a few months a year when the sea ice melts, well, it's four to five months now, the bears come on land. And that's why buggy one can roam around land and watch what the polar bears are doing because they're waiting for the sea ice to refreeze. Now, as soon as that sea ice refreezes on Hudson Bay, the polar bears will be long gone uh, they're out to hunt seals, that's what they really want. But in the meantime, again, they're pretty hungry. Uh, so we see them doing things like this, uh, digging around for food. Sometimes they'll eat seaweed. We see them sparring or play fighting with each other. It's pretty fantastic. So I encourage you to check out the polar bear cam if you can. Um, and I also just wanna point out, you can kind of see like this polar bear had spent quite a bit of time, maybe like 20 minutes digging around. We were wondering what she was doing. And she finally got this little vole but you can see that bull is not going to be enough to support that big bear. Again, polar bears really do need sea ice. They need to be eating seal blubber. They need a stable, happy, healthy environment to thrive. And what we can do 
um, is a bunch of things to help them. So the problem is that when we're burning fossil fuels for energy, we're releasing too many greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. In regular amounts, this is okay. It keeps us warm. These gases trap heat like a blanket. But what's happening is we're now releasing rampant amounts of emissions into the atmosphere because we're burning too many fossil fuels. So we're thickening this heat trapping blanket around Earth. And it's just getting too warm too quickly. And Arctic sea ice doesn't like that. Ice doesn't like the heat. We all know that. And so that's why we're seeing Arctic sea ice melting in certain areas. Now, there's a lot of things we can do because fossil fuels are the core issue here. So we can move away. We can have an energy shift away from fossil fuels. So you could check out if there's any solar or wind options or more renewable energy resources in your area. You can have maybe talk to your teachers or principal. They can look into it. We can also be more energy efficient. So the things that we do have that burn fossil fuels, we can make them burn them more efficiently so we're not wasting all these emissions. And one of the biggest things that we can do is talk about it. So that's through things like Philippe's book. That's an amazing way to frame what polar bears and other species are going through. That totally counts as talking about the issue. Uh, you can tell your friends that you like polar bears or other animals that are impacted uh, negatively in certain ways. If we just talk about what we're interested in and what the problem is, we start seeing a change happening. And it's just important when you're able to, to be able to share what you know and talk to other people about it. And we can make sure that we keep polar bears in the Arctic always, and we keep the Arctic sea ice habitat intact as long as we can move away from these fossil fuels. And it's just gonna take our community to get on board. So I don't want individual students worrying about this. This is not an individual problem, it's a group thing. So we're gonna work together to see this big shift happen. This is a community level issue. So see what's going on in your own communities. Maybe your school is already doing something really cool. Maybe you guys have like a bike program or some sort of like energy efficient uh, school um, lighting program or something like that. Whatever you might be doing in your world, uh, we would also love to hear about it at Polar Bears International. Uh, we love hearing what people are doing, especially students. And we also love taking questions and sharing what we know uh, so we're always available to chat with anyone. And we think that polar bears are very, very worthy of keeping in the Arctic. They're such a special species. Again, an umbrella species. So whatever we do for them is for all of us. And we hope that you come away from this having maybe even a bit more appreciation. Who doesn't like a polar bear? Uh, but the cool thing is, again, helping polar bears is going to help all the animals, including all the animals in the endangered book. So I want to thank you for your time, and I really look forward to taking questions and discussing more with uh, Philippe and Joe about polar bears. I'm going to stop sharing. There we go. All right. Cool. Perfect. Thank you. Alisa, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. I love that term, uh, umbrella species. I think that is such a great term that students should grab onto. You know, when we help them, we're helping more than just them, right? We're helping us too, and many, many other species. So Philippe, we'll bring you back into the conversation as well. Um, you know, Philippe, we just saw a lot of the work that Elisa does out in the field uh, and some of that research. When you, you know, started to plan for a book like this, um, how much research was involved? Well, I, you know, first I just want to say um, what a wonderful presentation. Uh, you know, I, I, it drives home the, both the incredible majesty and wonder of these animals, but also the responsibility that we have to protect them and, and the, the, the extraordinary work. Of Polar Bears International, and and in times like these, when there's a lot of bad news in the world, I want everyone on this webinar to remember that there are wonderful people and terrific organizations that are doing great work that we can turn to and that we can be a part of, and we can join on that journey. Um, so please, all of you, uh, remember Polar Bears International. Participate, join, follow that links, watch that webcam. I want the link. We're gonna have to put that up before we go in here because I'm gonna be watching webcam uh, for Polar Bears. Uh, and listen who, um, you know, uh, I think I would be happy to work most of my time in a lab for an opportunity to hold a little baby polar bear like that photo of you uh, early on, because that was, that that blew me away. So thank you. Um, you know, I, uh, uh, in, for us with the story, you know, knowing a lot about these animals and their plight already, we wanted to make sure that when we, you know, we felt that we had a responsibility uh, t when we were, telling the story and, and creating the backstory of these characters and these animals that, you know, we wanted to be accurate in terms of the struggles that they're, that they're facing. Um, book one really e examines New Killick's background. Um, and we worked with some polar bear researchers just to make sure that there was uh, accuracy in terms of the types of challenges that she was facing. Um, in particular, the, the, the loss of sea ice and, or the lack of sea ice, I should say, um, as really underscoring 
the, the, the problem that gets her then on this entire journey in the book. Um, but each of the characters have real, the black-footed ferrets, Jill and Hobbs, um, Arif, the orangutan, their backstories are all really grounded in the real types of problems that these animals are facing. Uh, it just so happens that New Killick was really the first character that we really dive into and examine. But Alyssa, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, um, of all the things that you've learned about polar bears, what is, um, is there, is there a little known fact, a favorite fact that you have about them that, that you didn't mention before? Um, one of the neat things about polar bears, and there's many that I think are cool, um, but the mothers, when they give birth to their babies, the babies are so little, just about a pound, but they grow exponentially fast. Um, they need to be able to walk maybe uh, 80 kilometers to sea ice after they're born, a few months after they're born. So they need to grow really fast, maybe 20 pounds in just a couple months. And part of how they do this is that their mother's milk when they're born is 33% that, which that, is like which whipping is like whipping cream, cream for us. For us. So the so amount of energy that the mom has to spend nursing her cubs, you can imagine, is huge. Um, but it helps the cubs be healthy faster and gets them out to the sea ice. And I just think that's a really, really neat way that moms take care of their cubs in the Arctic. I love that. Um, mm -hmm. That is, uh, the, the, isn't nature just fantastic? I, I, I tell yeah. you, it's, um, yeah. It's, it's always inspiring uh, to me to hear stories like that, just because these are the things that we just don't know, um, but you have to be in it to, 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 to see it. And you certainly have spent so much time focused on these animals. Um, yeah, so Joe, do you want to jump into questions from, from, the, from our viewers? Absolutely. We have tons of classrooms tuning in live via YouTube. Uh, so keep those shout outs coming. Now is the time. Let's dedicate the chat just to questions. Okay, we're going to work in some of the questions. And we have a bunch of camera classrooms joining us live today too, and they have uh, some great questions. So let's work some of those in. We're going to start with Mrs. Holt's group. There are fifth graders joining us in Innisfail. Uh, I believe that's here in Ontario, in Canada. So let's bring them in live. Hey, grade fives. Why do polar bears go to Hudson's Hi. Bay to mate? That's a great question. Yeah. So uh, polar bears that live in Hudson Bay already, they do mate on Hudson Bay for sure. But other polar bears that live in Norway or Russia or Greenland, they will mate closer to those areas. So uh, Hudson Bay does have three different subpopulations, though. And in the summer, they all kind of stay in their own spot. But in the winter, they're all mixed and they kind of mate with each other. And that helps the genes flow. And uh, when a population has the genes flowing around more, it's healthier. So it's a good thing that polar bears kind of mix on the sea ice and meet meet new bears. It's a good thing to do. But yeah, they mate all over the sea ice, depending on where they live. All right. Very cool. Great question mm -hmm. to get us started. Let's jump to another live class now. This time we're going to go to New Mexico. We have uh, Miss Nilvo's group hanging out with us uh, virtually in New Mexico. So let's bring her into the call. There they are. How are we doing in New Mexico? Good. How's everybody? <laughs> Good. Good um, to see you. Good. Well, my class, my third graders, we have studied um, a unit in reading um, when nature is losing its balance. We talked a lot about um, Yellowstone and the wolves and when they left and when they returned. So my students are asking a lot of these questions. They know that there are polar bears in zoos that they see all the time. So the question they have is, do you... Um, think polar bears will actually be able to adapt to a new environment eventually? And do you think that they're gonna head south to adapt to that so they can try to survive and live? And they're trying to figure out how that would happen, especially knowing that they live in a zoo. <laughs> I think that's such an important question. That's so, so great to be thinking that way. Uh, we do work with different zoos that have polar bears. And I have to tell you that these zookeepers that take care of polar bears do such a good job. But these polar bears eat so, so much food. Uh, because the polar bears aren't having to live in the Arctic cold and walk huge, vast distances like half a million square kilometers home range, uh, they don't need the amount of blubber. And so they can live more off fish and other foods in the zoo. Um, but just because the zoo polar bear is able to be cared for by humans and have constant steady food and health checks doesn't mean that a wild polar bear would be able to move south. So unfortunately, climate change is happening so fast and we're losing sea ice so quickly that polar bears don't physically have the ability to adapt enough 
uh, to allow them to live on land long term or move south. They really still are always going to be very much tied to the Arctic sea ice. They're such a specialized bear. We have other bears like uh, grizzly or brown bears or black bears that are more general and can live in kind of different types of habitats a little easier. But polar bears are so focused on Arctic sea ice and seals that we don't expect that they would be able to uh, move south or really make a living long term on land. In fact, we know that if polar bears are on land for over about 180 days, they reach kind of this threshold uh, where we'll start to see more reproductive failure. And starving because again they're just not getting their calories so really really important question to ask in terms of conservation of like what if this and what if that uh, but we do know with polar bears they do need arctic sea ice and i just want to add you made a really important point earlier uh Alyssa, that that if the polar bears are gone because of the the the, the, the sea ice disappears that's not just bad for the polar bears it's bad for all of us because of that albedo effect, because of the, the role that the Arctic plays in our global climate. So um, uh, that, that I think is really important to underscore here that, that in many ways, they're, they're also another term might be indicator species, right? Indicator species of the health of that ecosystem. And because that ecosystem, the Arctic and the Antarctic in the South is so important to how our planet works, um, if they disappear because of, uh, of this, the sea ice disappearing, then, then we're all in big trouble. Yeah, great addition. Thank you for adding that. Absolutely. All right. Let's take a little visit to YouTube. We have a few questions. Well, lots of questions coming in via YouTube. But Mrs. Smith's eighth grade virtual online class, they're wondering uh, about polar bears. Is there, is it just, you know, one species or are there subspecies? That's a great question, too, because some bear species kind of have subspecies. But with polar bears, it's just the one species right now. Yeah, we know certain areas, some bears are a little smaller than others, but overall, just the one species of polar bear. All right, keep those YouTube questions okay. coming. We've got lots of great questions uh, coming in. This time we're gonna take a little trip to California. We've got Mr. Barcinas joining us. Let me bring him live into the call here. There we go. Hey, California. Hi, yeah, my class is on with me uh, on Zoom and they've been sending me lots of uh, questions on the chat. And one of them is, um, how many polar bears have you tagged or are currently studying? So that's a very good question. Um, I've tagged, I guess, at least a few dozen. I'd have to add it up over the years. Um, maybe more than 100, potentially. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'd have to go back. And how many are we studying right now? Also, great question. Uh, you know, some of our research is pretty broad. Um, so for example, one thing we're studying right now is we have a polar bear radar system set up in Churchill, and we're training it with artificial intelligence to figure out um, what a polar bear looks like on the landscape so that in the future, we could send these radar packages up across the north, and it could pick up a polar bear coming into a town and text message somebody in town saying, hey, there's a polar bear coming. So those sorts of things are very important for humans and polar bears, but it's really hard to count how many bears are involved in that. Um, the right now, I'd say we're on the tender tracking in Churchill, at least a few dozen polar bears. There's been a lot of action there. We also study polar bears in Russia and Norway, um, in Alaska. So I'd ha maybe have to say hundreds. I don't have a hard count though. Very good question. I'm going to pass that on to my team and see if they actually ever thought about that question before. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Well, Philippe, I'm curious, have you uh, been lucky enough to get out and see polar bears in the wild? Oh, Philippe, we got you on mute. There, there we go. go. Uh, you know, I was, uh, from my show, Awesome Planet, uh, syndicated show that I host, just premiered the sixth season this past weekend. We've been working on getting out to see polar bears for that uh, series. And unfortunately, the timing just has not worked out. And when we had planned actually to try and go up this year uh, for this season, uh, of course, the the current uh, coronavirus situation put a stop to that. But uh, hopefully next year um, when things settle down, we hope, and uh, we can get up there for season seven. Uh, so I'll be giving you a call, Alyssa, about that. All right, very, very cool. Let's grab another live class from here. Let's go to, we're gonna go back to, let's go to British Columbia this time in Canada. We've got some fourth and fifth graders hanging out with Mrs. Painter. Let me see if I can bring them in here. There they are. We'll be on camera. How are we doing, British Columbia? 
You're doing great, can you hear us? We got the loud and clear. Okay, so we, um, we have a few questions. Um, maybe one of the most important ones is, what can we do uh, to help with this energy shift that you, that you spoke about? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. There are a few different things you can do depending on what you're interested in or what you're able to do. Uh, for students, again, I think the biggest thing is to work together. So look for community level programs and leverage the adults in your life. So give your parents homework and give your teachers some homework and let's work together to see what's out there. So a couple options, uh, you could ask your parents, where does the energy in your home come from? Um, is it possible where you're from in British Columbia to have some sort of solar or wind power incorporated? Or what can you can you talk to your energy company? I know you have BC Hydro in British Columbia. I'm also from British Columbia originally. Um, but see what that looks like. You could also challenge another school. So do you have a school in your district that's maybe like a sports rival? You can make them an energy rival. So you could see over the course of a month or a year even, uh, what school can save the most energy with turning uh, their lights off and having uh, different types of energy that they're using. Uh, see, see what's out there. We actually have some great examples on our website if you'd like to get in touch. Uh, you could also even start a bike program with another school or for yourself. There's some schools in California, for example, that do pedal for polar bears. So for every student that rides their bike to school, uh, you raise money or get a check mark and there's big prizes at the end. So I think the important thing is working together as a group, making it fun um, and just having the same goal that this is good for polar bears, but it's also good for your school and for yourselves in your own clean, healthy environment as well. So thank you so much. It's such a great question. A lot of great options out there. Yeah, I just want to add um, as well, you know, you made a really important point, uh, you know, politically, even if you're not old enough to vote, being a champion for endangered species, being champion for nature to your parents and to, to older siblings, maybe, um, and reminding them just how important that is uh, when they go to the polls and vote. And then, of course, when you're old enough to vote, that's really, really important to engage with. There's also a, an energy audit. So uh, I just posted this, Joe, a link in the, in the chat here if you want to share with, uh, with everybody later. Uh, um, at Earth Echo, the nonprofit that I founded, we do lots of work with uh, students around the world and we have lots of fun resources. We actually have an energy audit. There you go. If you go to this link, uh, we have an energy audit uh, resource and tool that you can do both in your school and at home and look at all the different ways that you're using energy at home and then ways to reduce that energy use. Um, and I know here, for example, in Los Angeles, where we get our energy from the local provider, you can check a box and it's maybe a few cents more per kilowatt hour um, but you can determine, uh, uh, tell them that you want to use renewable energy in your home. And we also have solar panels on the roof of this home. We drive an electric car. So there's lots of different stuff that, that, that all of us can do. Our food is very energy intensive. So if you can get food locally, um, that helps things like composting helps, help save energy and reduce water use. So there's lots of different fun things that you can do at school and at home to really help, um, with your energy footprint. All right. I love those answers. Um, all things that students can do. Um, I'm flashing a couple websites up here now. So the Earth Echo website is up now. And then for those who want to dive a little bit deeper into some Polar Bears International Action, I have that website uh, up there as well. And I'll make sure I share it in the YouTube chat, uh, as well as with our teachers who are joining us live on camera. Okay, let's grab some more questions here. Let's head over to... We need to see Mrs. Short. Her class is grade eights joining us in Sarnia, Ontario, here in Canada. Let's bring them in. There they are. How are we doing, grade eights? Good. <laughs> Do adult polar bear stay in the same home place they grew up as cubs, or did they travel somewhere else to live? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, in certain areas, polar bears uh, have what we call site fidelity. So it does mean that they come back to the same area that they grew up in as cubs. But that's usually just for those periods of time they're on land. When polar bears go out on the sea ice to hunt, they're not territorial because the sea ice is always moving and cracking and changing. So it doesn't make sense to try to stay in the, to stay in the exact same spot. Uh, so they'll move in different areas. But generally, they always come back to the same spot. And we know that mothers with cubs tend to come back to the same spot to have their new babies every few years. So they they like where they're from. That's a great question, thank you. All right, good question. Let's see, who haven't we visited yet? Ah, we gotta go to Quebec. We're gonna head over to Quebec. We've got some fifth graders hanging out with us. Let me bring them live into the call here. There we go. Uh, bonjour, Mr. Gusto. Um, my question is how many time can a polar bear live without food? 
your question. Well, I'm good. Bonjour, un plaisir. Merci uh, de, de, de nous joindre aujourd'hui. Um, but I'm going to pass on that answer to the expert, that the question to the expert. Thank you so much for the question. Um, it does depend on the bear. Uh, we know that mother uh, polar bear, so when a female gets pregnant, she'll go into a den, she'll give birth, she'll have the babies and nurse them, and then she doesn't get out to the sea to eat again, and that can take eight months. So some polar bears can go eight months without eating. Now those females are very, 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 very fat before they go into their den. So they've got tons of body fat to help them get them through that time period. For the average polar bear, uh, in Churchill anyway, what we see is polar bears go often four to five months without eating and they're still, they can still do pretty well depending on how they ate before they started fasting. Uh, but there is a limit at which polar bears start to have a really tough time. And, and when we start to hit about six months, most polar bears uh, are going to be feeling that and some aren't going to be doing very well. And then if we're looking at seven, eight months, we're going to see more and more issues for polar bears. So they can go quite a while without eating, but it is important that they get the next meal pretty soon because you know they're only thinking about food all day every day. That's for sure. <laughs> all right, fair enough. So a couple kind of just general polar bear questions that have come up uh, regularly in the chat. So. Um, Mr. Pettick's group in California, uh, they're very curious about uh, the lifespan. And then it uh, looks like Ms. McGee has a question about Arctic foxes. So um, sometimes you see pictures of them kind of together. Is there kind of a relationship between polar bears and Arctic foxes? Oh, I love that question. Yeah, there kind of is. So um, Arctic foxes will follow polar bears out onto the sea ice. So the polar bear goes for a hunt and the Arctic fox knows what's about to happen. The Arctic fox will eat the polar bear leftovers. So the polar bear gets its fill, gets the good parts and will move on to hunt the next seal. And the Arctic fox, along with um, often birds in the area, come and eat the leftover seal pieces uh, that the polar bear left behind. And Arctic foxes make a pretty good living this way. And actually on the polar bear cams this last weekend, uh, we did see a seal had washed up on shore and a bunch of polar bears had at it. And then when they were done, a red fox went in and stole a piece and then ravens were coming in. So uh, polar bears really being at the top of the food chain, they are bringing nutrients uh, down from the ocean up on top onto the sea ice. So they're kind of doing this nutrient cycle in a way and allowing these other animals, terrestrial animals to eat um, ocean foods, which is pretty cool. They're sharing their food around. So it's really great to see the foxes following the polar bears out there. It's pretty cute. All right, and I think uh, the the first part was lifespan, right. Lisa. Yeah. Lifespan, yep, thank you. Uh, so female polar bears can live into their mid 20s, sometimes kind of late 20s. Male polar bears is more often early 20s or so. Male polar bears fight for mates and they fight pretty hard. So they have it pretty rough on their bodies out there. So they don't live quite as long as females. Of course, polar bears in zoos, which you've talked about, do tend to live a little bit longer because they're a little more pampered. And polar bears in zoos can live into their 30s. And the oldest known polar bear uh, was 42 years old and her name was Debbie and she lived in Winnipeg but she passed a few years ago now. All right. Um, you know, what I love about an event like this, you know, talking to you, Elisa, having uh, you here with us, Philippe, is, you know, you were two incredible examples of having a passion and finding a way to turn your passion into your career. And I think, you know, that's something all students should be looking for is how can they turn something they're passionate about into their career so work doesn't feel like work. So I'd love to hear from each of you, you know, Elisa, uh, how you came to be, uh, working with polar bears and then Philippe, you know, what what drove you to want to work so hard to protect the world around us? Yeah, I just grew up with a love for animals, but I didn't think being a veterinarian was for me. Uh, so I went to school to study wildlife biology and I actually studied uh, mice and bulls and frogs for quite a few years. And then it was the connections I made. So I was willing and able to volunteer my time for different projects and meet new people. And I kind of just honestly had a bit of stroke of luck and started working with a polar bear biologist in Alberta. Um, and from there again, I just tried to be a really hard worker. I got along with everyone I worked with. I asked a lot of questions. I volunteered when I could. And you just kind of see all these doors opening and opportunities coming. And um, I think having that passion, if you have it, it's every day you wake up and yeah, like like you said, it doesn't really feel like work. It's just like, oh, what am I going to get to do today? Who am I going to meet? Uh, what projects are they working on? How could I help? 
and it just kind of slowly builds over time. And I think looking for uh, doors to open and taking them the opportunities when you can help me kind of get to a place I never dreamed of when I was a student. I, again, grew up in British Columbia studying mice. I never thought I'd be working in the Arctic with polar bears. So you never know, but follow where your passion takes you, I think, if you can. Mm -hmm. You know, Lisa makes a really important point um, that uh, uh, not necessarily knowing exactly where you're going to end up, where you want to go with some of these groups. Similar to me, I always knew that I wanted, you know, growing up, my grandfather was an explorer. My father was an explorer and filmmaker. And, um, but I, you know, a lot of people assume I'm a marine biologist or scientist. I do so much work with the ocean. Actually, I studied history at university. So I always had a passion for uh, literature and, and history and, and um, finding my path to being able to use that passion in conservation with animals um, was really about the work that I do through Earth Echo. So it wasn't, we don't do necessarily direct conservation work. We support organizations that do. We're about really telling stories about nature and, and doing education for young people like you all watching. And that's been the way that I've been able to pursue my personal passion and combine it with um, uh, conservation in the environment. And so I think that's that's a really important thing. Uh, uh, I wanna echo what, what Elise was saying about um, your work and your passion, no matter what it is, whether you wanna you know, uh, 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 be an engineer or a doctor or a scientist or, or a writer or whatever it is, um, that you can find a, a path. I wrote a children's book, a fiction book about animals, um, but it's inspired by their real stories. And so that's an example of no matter what your passion is, you can find ways to tell stories about nature, find ways to tell stories that matter and inspire people to make the world better. Um, and, and yes, I encourage all of you um, to look for opportunities and, and be follow, stay in school, follow all these 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 curriculum and these these um, these subjects of the physics and the science and the STEM and all that. But then also the art and the history and the storytelling components as well. And, and find your passion, bring those together, and you can do great things. All right, I love that point, uh, Philippe. More and more scientists are realizing that if this, their story is going to get out, they need you know people documenting it, video, um, you know campaigns um books and such so that storytelling is just such a key component and some scientists joe let's remember each of us are storytellers and we can we have these things in our hands that that are able to tell a story when my grandfather started out in the 1950s they had 11 minutes of film on these old cameras and, and the original cameras underwater didn't even have a viewfinder or focus, they just had to point and click. And then it took weeks to develop that film before they could see what they took. Now we have high def 4K video immediately on our phone. So all of you are storytellers. All of you have the power to be champions for these types of issues, um, to support organizations like Polar Bears International, to participate in education programs like you are doing today and all the work that Earth Echo provides and be champions at home, champions in your communities. Um, and be active and engaged. And that is how we're going to save polar bears and ourselves. And I have tremendous hope. I know, Elisa, you do as well, uh, Joe. I mean, that's why we do this work because we believe in you, not just as the leaders of tomorrow, but as the leaders of today. And I, I just wanna stress that point too, is that recognizing no matter what your passion is, no matter what you're interested in, that you have the power to have tremendous impact on your community, on the world today um, in so many different ways. And so remember that there's always hope and optimism uh, with all the bad news out there, put that aside because um, I believe in you all. Yeah, absolutely. And that is why I want to share this before we wrap up today is that we're just getting started with the Endangered Action and meeting amazing conservationists around the world. So coming up at the end of the week, we have the Pangolin. Uh, we're going to meet Katie Schuler and uh, her colleague Mark in Nigeria. And they're going to talk about pangolins um how they're the you know one of the most highly trafficked animals on the planet and we're going to get to meet mark he protects pangolins um he it's, runs a, a rescue uh for pangolins so we're going to get to meet a pangolin up close and personal on friday it should be pretty awesome and as you look further on uh we're going to meet justin grubb and orangutans terry's going to talk about narwhals later in the month and we'll wrap up with the world wildlife funds christy Bly talking about the black footed ferret so lots of stories to share and you know good news stories which i think get overlooked sometimes in the media is that there are people fighting uh to make a difference for animals uh and our planet and you can all be one of them and we need you to be one of them we need you um working with with all of us uh to make this happen and, and we can do incredible things and so yes looking forward to the rest of this month narwhals unicorns of the sea we've got orangutans all sorts of wonderful things 
Um, but of course, the uh, the pangolin Nukilik, or the the polar bear Nukilik, she's the the hero of this story and the hero for me. And and so so excited and thrilled that, that we were able to to to, to have a, a Lisa join us today and, and talk about them and and uh, and have you all participate. It was so much fun. All right. Well, Lisa, a huge thank you. A shout out to the Yukon. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks to Polar Bears uh, International. Philippe, great uh, to have you kicking things off with us. Thank you for everything that you do. Looking forward to the events coming up. And thank you to all of our classrooms. Thank you to the hundreds and hundreds uh, of students who joined us live on YouTube. Thank you to our camera classrooms. You're pretty awesome. In fact, why don't you come in for a second? Give us a big wave. Right. So great to have you live. We're so excited for Friday. Uh, yeah, have a great week until then. Uh, Elisa, thank you. Philippe, thank you. Thank you, thank you. everybody out there. I just want to reiterate too that if you have any questions about the book or the characters, we've got more information online, registration, lots of stuff, adoption kits with World Wildlife Fund, uh, links to partner organizations. It's all at theendangered.com. Anything you want to know about um, links to Earth Echo or anything else, it's all there. So um, we'll look forward to seeing y'all on Friday. Awesome. Good stuff. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your week. Thank you.